good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. And um, let's go ahead and stand together, if you will. We're going to take our hymnals. I think you recognize the song that's being played. And uh, hymn 411, if you want your, you're going to need your hymnals tonight. We're going to try to get some lights on for you so everybody can see. There we go. Um, 411, you will need your hymnals. So go ahead and turn there. I know you know it, but you may not know all the verses. And uh, tonight's one of those nights we're singing all four of them, all right? So, McKenna, if you get caught not singing, we're bringing a mic to whoever's not singing, all right? And you're going to be on the hot mic, Miss Faye, so you better at least keep those lips moving. And, uh, boy, what a privilege it is to sing about our love for the one who loved us so much he died for us. Hymn 411, let's sing it together. study trust you're having a good week and trust you've come to hear from the Lord tonight and I hope that the fellowship and the worship to him and the word of God will strengthen and help us tonight and let's ask him to meet with us brother James would you stand and lead us in this opening prayer please Amen. We just want to mention a couple things to you. We don't have any announcements per se, uh, but just a couple things. We have a special treat uh, Sunday morning. Of course, Sunday is a special day 
in and of itself, first of all, because we get to come and worship the Lord, amen, every Sunday is a Resurrection Sunday, uh, but then we also honor and recognize our mothers, and always a special uh, day, and so we encourage you to be here, have as much as your family in service with us, and that morning, we'll be hearing from the young ladies of our young adult Sunday school class by way of special in song, and uh, so we're excited about that. I think they are practicing after the service tonight in, in this building or the next, this building, um, so ladies, if you'll be prepared for that, and uh, y'all can go ahead and get that knocked out and still get the kids home at a good time, and uh, so keep that in mind. We look forward to that, and then uh, we never want to make anybody feel bad, but I'll always just let you know on all the holidays, Mother's Day, Father's Day, we still have church on Sunday night, and uh, I'm a family man, you know that, and I love Mama uh, as much as any boy can love Mama and love being with family, but never want to put those things over the Lord, and uh, he is first and foremost, and so we're going to have service and just pastorally, and as your friend, we encourage you to be in service, and uh, don't let those other gatherings take priority over the Lord, and uh, love on the family the afternoon and in the evening, and uh, be in his house that night. So we will have service regular time, no choir practice, but we will have service, so keep that in mind. And then just a quick update uh, on the plans for tonight. Uh, we try not to postpone, postpone things if we do not have to, but uh, the reason I was just a couple minutes slipping back in here I was in here fellowshipping and we had some of our teachers from the community show up we ran into a little snag this year and uh, brother Caleb did not get but a two-day notice uh, on it from what he tells me and uh, after going to all the schools and passing out all the flyers we were conveniently told as of Monday two days ago uh, that those flyers were not allowed to be passed out until we went through, I think her name was Amber, Miss, uh, Miss Amber, uh, which we appreciate her service here in the community. She's the head of the school departments, and we've not ran into that. This is what our third or fourth year doing this. We've not ran into that in the past, and so we were kind of surprised, and so we were kind of in a catch-22. Uh, we knew that with information not going out earlier and the teachers not really being notified in most cases that we would struggle uh, reaching them tonight. But then we also knew that if some had been invited personally or gotten word that they may come, and that's what happened. Those ladies were very sweet and kind about it. And here's what touched me. They said, man, we remember this event, and we really had a great time last time we come. And uh, so I told them they get a double blessing. They could come tonight and, and get fed spiritually and then come back and get fed physically at another time. Uh, but praise the Lord, they, they had Bible studies to go to. And so I encouraged them to go to their Bible studies tonight and inviting them back. So that is why, that is why the change. And uh, so we're going to have to reroute a little bit and make sure we start with Miss Amber first. Again, we appreciate her office and, appre and, and what she does. And uh, they just, I guess they have to give an approval now before uh, these things from church goes into the hands of the teachers, so I'm told. And um, so let's pray about that. We'll try to regroup for our teachers here. Just want to explain to you. And the reason for doing that, uh, we, we felt like the wisdom was if we're going to do it as an event to, to appreciate teachers both here and in our community, the way to be effective of that is to have those show up. And so uh, we feel like postponing that was the best decision uh, with what we had. And so just wanted to bring that to your attention. All right, let's worship the Lord in our giving. This is our regular tithes and offerings. We commend you. And as always, challenge you to give to the Lord. And he's been so faithful to each and every one of us. For that, we are grateful. And so let's ask him to bless the offering. And then uh, in your sections, you can just come after that. Brother Caleb, would you stand and lead us, please?
Praise the Lord for that truth, and I would uh, admonish us, because he lives, we still have a story to tell, amen? And that is the greatest story, and the story of Jesus, salvation, and what he's done for us. We're the ambassadors for Christ, which means we're to share the gospel with those that the Lord gives us opportunity. Let's stand together again. You'll need your hymnals tonight, hymn 371, 371, and ascend the light. That is our commission. That is what we're here to do as individuals. Certainly as a church in this community, hymn number 371, send the light on the first and last together. you back to your seats and uh, thank you musicians always do a phenomenal job we're so blessed here and appreciate them so much invite you to take your bibles and go to titus a little book of titus uh, chapter one we're not forgetting about our prayer time we'll come back and conclude our service with that uh, this evening time of prayer together right now we want to get into the word titus uh, chapter one as you're turning there let me just uh, mention uh, three things briefly. Uh, first of all, with the special services that we have had uh, recently, Brother James referred to those in his prayer. Uh, we have a thank you card I want to read. Thank you so much for the beautiful flowers and your love and prayers uh, from Brother Roger and uh, Miss Faye, and uh, appreciate uh, that, and want to share that with the church family. And uh, then just wanted to thank you in light of all of our special services that we have had of late. Uh, I want to thank all of you. Uh, for how you have pitched in and helped and how you have uh, served and uh, your know, Wednesday night uh, w was a blessing and uh, so so thankful to be able to get that many teens under the sound of the preaching of the gospel and man our men outside obviously did a flawless job with the parking uh, we had no uh, cases and no uh, problems that arose that uh, uh, got to us so we're thankful for that the men inside helping with the chairs and and all that you bringing guests and inviting people being friendly to them and we just thank you for all that and uh, those that served uh, there in the gym in the pizza dinner and then those that helped in the nursery it was uh, not only a blessing to see that but you know there's joy in serving Amen. and I hope that you've learned that and uh, I get blessed by brother Linwood by watching our people serve in those capacities and just have the joy of the Lord about them. And I trust that you don't do any of those things just because you were asked or you were obligated or your quote-unquote position calls for that. But I hope it's in your heart to serve. And uh, so I want to thank you as your pastor for, for doing that. And then our focused on the Family Day Sunday. Many of you have already been to me and just uh, have thanked me or commented on the format that you like that and was it was, felt like it was beneficial and a help to you. And, of course, I appreciate Brother Donnie and Miss Trudy, their time, but more importantly, their heart 
for the Lord and for his word and for the family and how God used them. And so thank you for that uh, feedback. We don't do things for feedback, but it is encouraging to know that it touched you and helped you and was a blessing uh, and you benefited from that. And so uh, thank you for that and for your kind words. And then, uh, as uh, you know by now, uh, when uh, we are away, unless it is entirely impossible, and uh, by that I mean uh, four or five churches in a single area are closed doors and do not have church, we are in church uh, when we are traveling and end up kind of being a little staycation vacation, but we were able to be in two of our Freel Baptist churches while uh, we were away. And as always, I'm, I'm learning and I, I'm looking at uh, things that... Uh, our blessing to me as a pastor going in as a visitor, as well as, as looking for areas to be challenged in. And so uh, I've kind of over the years uh, bring back something uh, to our church family just to, to note. And so these things tonight, just a couple of them, uh, I don't know if it'll hit you as a blessing or it, it will some. For some, it'll be a challenge, you know, some it'll be something you're thankful for, um, and some it'll be something like, man, we. Uh, I need to allow that to speak to my heart, and so so here they are in, in our travels. The two things that uh, that we that I noticed and was either blessed or challenged by one uh, man. Uh, the music in the churches that we were in was, was good and God honoring. I'm thankful for that. But what caught me and uh, was the first service we were in for the Sunday morning. Uh, their choir they had they had a rather large uh, uh, choir, uh, probably uh, uh, double, uh, a little more than double in in, in number wise. Is, is what we have here, but for the choir members, they stood the entire part of the first service. In fact, there was no chairs in the choir, and it wasn't one of these, like, you know, I hate to use the word liberal, but it wasn't one of these fads just, like, move the chairs to look cool, um, but just the format of their Sunday morning service, there was no chairs, and so for the choir members, they stood the entire time, but that's not what caught my attention. Obviously, I noticed that, but what caught my attention was, was really a blessing. The fervency that the choir worshiped the Lord with during the entire part of the first, first part of the service. And you say, why was that such a big deal? Well, my mind works like yours does, and I'm sitting there thinking, now, if them choir members don't got no chairs, at some point, they're going to get a little long face and start huffing and puffing at their neighbor and getting a little upset that they can't sit down. But I'm telling you, I was blessed by how they worshiped the Lord. In spite of whether that was a blessing or a challenge to them personally. Here's what it, it reminded me of. Our worship's all about him and not about us. And if we get sideways because we don't have a chair to sit in or the service is a little too long or the music part of the service is a little too long or too short or the preacher didn't go long enough. I hear that one all the time. Um, <laughs> or whatever the, whatever the little prick is we got to be honest, we've made the worship about us and not about him. So I was blessed by that, and maybe we're challenged by that, maybe we're blessed by it, but that was a, a takeaway uh, for me. You could tell it was all about uh, him and not about them. And then the second thing was uh, the male security at each of the churches uh, we went to. Uh, it was not only on top of things, uh, but greeted us and met us before we could even get to the building. Uh, now, maybe it's because of the crew walking in with me, and they said, hey, this is a suspicious crowd, you know, let's, let's check them before they get to the door. You know, my kids can, you know, kind of have that aroma sometimes. <laughs> no, but I just thought a church, that man, they were on top of things, and they saw via cameras or via a, a door somewhere that guests were coming in, and before I could even get to the door and open it for my wife and kids, it was done for us. And we walked right into a smiling face, uh, a greeter, you know, uh, of male security in these cases, and uh, informed us where the restrooms were if we needed anything and just took care of us. And I said, man, what a testimony for a church uh, to be on top of things, looking for people uh, coming in. And as things we try to do here, but sometimes those shot in the arms are just a reminder to us or an encouragement to us uh, either way. Uh, and then the last thing is I just want to thank our choir. Uh, Again, I, I don't even know how many people have already come to me uh, over the last, from last Wednesday and Sunday and said, man, the choir has just sounded awesome uh, these last few services. And so thank you, choir. We thank them a lot in our uh, rehearsal time, especially for the new songs they've put in 
uh, to the services in the first five months of this year. But thank you, choir, and uh, not only for the job well done you do, uh, but for your heart uh, to minister. And I'm so thankful uh, to be a part of that and uh, thankful for our music ministry here at Wildwood. All right? All right, it's preaching time. Titus chapter 1, just good to be back with you. And I wanted to get uh, those things uh, to your ears and heart. As we study through uh, Titus, as in many cases, you go back a long ways uh, when you hit the context of these passages and uh, you realize and begin to understand, in this case Paul, teaching Titus of some things that were going on long ago, right? And so the easy, the easy thing to do that would be a mistake is up front say, well, man, this was a problem uh, back then to the Christians, to the people of Crete, but it is not a problem to us. But in this case, that would be a mistake because even though uh, this is being addressed a long time ago, we still see, uh, in fact, the relevance is still quite amazing, to be honest with you. Um, in context, what he is dealing with here in the latter part of chapter 1 with what we still struggle with today. So we acknowledge that cultures change, yes or no. Societies change, yes or no. And sometimes the problems you deal with based on a culture and a society changing also change or they worsen or maybe some slim cases they get better. Uh, but here we see a relevance that still remains today. St still a battle uh, that the local Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, fundamental church deals with and has to be on guard uh, even in our day uh, today. Similar uh, challenges. So uh, the issues that Titus, uh, through Paul's direction, is dressing with the people of, of Crete here are still issues that we got to be on guard today. And so if you're taking notes, our title tonight is simply that, Staying on Guard. Staying on guard as a people of God and as a local church in the community uh, that God has uh, placed us to be a beacon of hope and light uh, to the people around us. Paul gives Titus instruction here that I believe will be good for us uh, today. If you're physically able, would you stand once more with us? Uh, we do that to honor the reading of the Word of God. Titus chapter 1. We'll jump into verse 10 and to read through the end of this first chapter. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, the religious crowd, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them passively. So that's not what my Bible says. Sometimes when we come to the rebuking part of, of ministry and things of that nature, that that's how today's world approaches it, isn't it? So passive, and we don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. We don't want to offend nobody. Bless God, we may offend them, and they may leave the church. So let's, let's just let's be careful how we go about this. Well, that's not the spirit we have here to young Titus, is it? He's told to rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Now, just as the word sharply is important, so is the latter part of that verse. It wasn't to expose them and put their name and face on a wall or social media of the day. It wasn't to have an ad in the paper ran about them to shame them. The purpose of the rebuke is the same purpose we always see for rebuke in the Bible, and that is to bring them back, to make them sound in the faith, to bring them back to truth. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. If you don't mind marking in your Bible that, that phrase to highlight that, underline that. They profess that they know God. But in works, they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and in every good work reprobate. Now, is verse 16, unfortunately, not still applicable in 2024? 
They profess. They say. <laughs> they want you to believe. But their words, or, or their words do not match their walk. And they're unfaithful in those ways. Thank you kindly for standing. You may be seated. Staying on guard. Church, as faithful as, as we desire to be and as careful as we are in our walk and our ministry and the direction that God has pointed Wildwood, let me tell you something. We should never shun a reminder and a challenge to stay on guard. Whether in our personal life or in corporate ch church life, and we've got to understand the Holy Spirit can apply this message as always, however He desires to do in your heart, but we got to understand the context here of what was going on in the churches and in the community and why Paul was leading Titus to address these things. And so never shun, ne never, never belittle a challenge to stay on guard. For we need that in this day. And the devil never seeks to miss an opportunity to work his way in to a church that is trying to honor the Lord and trying to stay on course and going against the grain of the day. For he highlights every opportunity he can get to get in there and disrupt things. So let's receive the challenge tonight to stay on guard. And would you ask the Holy Spirit to help you in this time? Lord, may your word go forth as always. It, it is quick. It is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And I pray you'll do the work tonight that your Holy Spirit, only your Holy Spirit can do. I'm just a mouthpiece. I'm just a vessel, a voice. Now, Lord, I want to be faithful to your word and faithful to what you've called me to do and faithful to, to warn us as a congregation, Lord, and to challenge us uh, in this very area tonight. Lord, we know the enemy is fierce. We know, Lord, uh, in light of churches, Lord, the enemy is trying to do everything they can to disrupt and to get into the middle of Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches who are trying to stay true to what you've called us to do and who you've called us to be. So, Lord, may we take to heart tonight and, and, and see what is happening here in the warnings, Lord, and, and in our own minds be reminded of the importance of staying on guard and not allowing the subtle ways of our adversary to creep into what you are wanting to accomplish through the local church here in this community. So bless us. Help us. It's in your son's name we ask these things. Amen. And amen. Number one is really the context of the message, and that is this. Guard against a false message. Guard against a false message. Paul here through uh, uh, Titus revealed the presence of those who taught a deceptive message. How many of you have ever listened to someone talk and you knew while listening to them they were deceiving you? Whether it's a spiritually, hopefully not here or anywhere locally, but maybe uh, somebody on TV, a few names come to mind, right? Or maybe just in conversation with someone, you, as you're listening to someone, it's, I don't know, maybe things just don't seem to add up, and you begin to think, man, this person is being deceptive. This, this person is not telling me uh, the truth. So they address that here because the context is certainly a false teachings that are being uh, dealt with here. Verse 10, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. That carries in itself the idea of deception, right? And so they're dealing with the false teaching. Many of them, as mentioned by way of circumcision, were Jewish legalists that taught that circumcision and adherence to the law was essential for salvation. Now, you may not get the circumcision part today because of customs and times, but adherence to the law, or we've kind of come up with our own religious list today in, in the false religion circles of do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, and you'll be okay on your way to heaven, right? Still exists today, right, church? And so they were teaching these things as necessary or essential for salvation. And so Paul says, hey, these things are unruly. Literally, it's rebellious and insubordinate to the Word of God. Can I, can I just hit the pause button for a minute and say it does not matter what you hear any teacher with whatever clout 
that teacher or preacher has, if what they say does not come from and line up with the Word of God, it has no merit, it has no authority, and it is completely wrong. And you either need to dismiss yourself from that setting, cut the TV off, cut the radio off, whatever the setting is, and make sure that you are getting clear and sound preaching from the Word of God. Paul says it's unruly. They're not, they're not submitting themselves to the Word of God. He goes on to describe them as disobedient and, and undisciplined in their teaching. And at the root of the issue here, I believe, is still a root in our issue today. And that is there was a refusal for them to submit to the authority of God's Word. If you ask me, I think one of the reasons that nobody's going to ever tell you in an interview, by the way, of why they have, they have pulled off from the principles and precepts and commandments and teachings of God's Word is because there is an unwillingness in their life, in their ministry, maybe both, to submit to the authority of the Word of God. And so because in our uh, humanity, in our flesh, in our sinful natures, we have a problem with submitting in general terms, but we certainly have a problem with submitting to the authority of God. Well, we've just got so crafty and so creative that rather than now uh, uh, taking that and like having your toes stepped on and letting the Holy Spirit drill and do the work, we now just move away from that. And that is why one of the reasons we have so many various teachings and instruction from pulpits that do not line up with the Word of God. So there's a struggle to submit to the authority of God. And so because of that uh, 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 struggle to submit, their speech was empty, their speech was worthless, their speech was deceptive, their speech was uh, brought about confusion. Now, now, church, if your eyes and ears are open to our society that describes us pretty well. People are confused. People are deceived. And when the two mesh together, they're, they're arguing over what used to be basic understandings and principles from the world. No, my preacher said, my, hey, forget what whoever said. What does the Word of God say? That is our standard. That is still our authority. And so they're addressing this matter of, of Vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. But notice what verse 11 says, whose mouths must be stopped. Notice what's happening, who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not to. And then we're given a reason for that that we'll get to in just a minute. So when they say that their mouths must be stopped, can I say the obvious? This was not encouraging violence you know because you're going to have this little old guy over here in his skinny jeans you know and holes on and dressed like he just walked out of somewhere that i wouldn't want to have no part of telling you oh no we don't believe in violence now we, we don't want to be too aggressive telling people what they should and shouldn't do so Paul is not encouraging violence. He's not encouraging to go grab somebody, you know, by the shirt or by the throat and raise them up on the wall and you're going to tell them something. But he is saying that what was going on by the vain talkers and the deceivers, their mouths, what they were saying had to be put to an end. There had to be a, a stop. Why? Because heresy and false doctrine was plaguing the community, and beginning to plague the church. And you know one of the mistakes? And Brother Austin, it's hard to even say this anymore and, and have a clear understanding of the church today, <laughs> because you have so many variants, right? Is that when this stuff started happening and stuff started creeping in from the world to the church, there wasn't enough men with backbone to stand up and say, nope, it stops right there. 
We're not going any further. We're not entertaining any ideas. We're not going to try it to see if it works. We're not going to do it because it helps us reach more people. There were few men that were willing to stand up. And now you got in the mix of a church, a little bit of the world and a little bit of the society and a little bit of what you want and a little bit of what they want and a little bit of what we used to have and a little bit of what we hope to have. And you got a mess, a confused mess in many churches today. Why? Why? Because there wasn't a willingness to say, listen, we're, we're going to be loving, we're going to be kind, but it stops right here. That's not what God called us to be. That's not who God called us to be. That's not his design and his purpose for the church. And so the false teaching could not be ignored. It could not be left unchecked. So Titus had to, to be willing. That's a big part had to be willing to say, okay, something's got to be done about this. Something's got to be said. We, we've got to stop the damage and the destruction that's being done. Understand that this had weakened communities. It had wreaked havoc in the communities. And if it's affecting your communities, you understand we're not talking about grocery stores and businesses. Who does it affect? And you break that down to individual what? Now it matters a little bit more, right? Because now you're, we're understanding that there were individual families being affected by, by, by false doctrine and teachings. And at the time, nothing was being done about it. Nobody was stopping it. Nobody was saying, ho, 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 no, 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 no. Get away from that. That's not truth. You, you've got to stay the course. And so we see the importance and the need for, for Paul to admonish Titus and for Titus here in his book to say, listen, we cannot stand for this any longer. We have to say something. Cannot be ignored. G. Campbell Morgan said this, Titus had to silence all these rebels, empty talkers and deceivers because they were causing great upheaval in the church. Then he goes on to say this. Think about this because this is what we veer away from. There are forms of evil which demand the surgeon's knife. Now, Brother Walter, are there, are there things that sometimes come up in the church that a pastor or a superintendent or a teacher or godly man, a godly lady in the church can maybe pull somebody aside and say, hey, listen, we, we, we want to talk to you. We want to show you a few verses and principles from God's Word. We, we, we've seen something that's a little concerning, and we just want to make sure we as a church are discipling you and helping you to understand why or why not and this and that. Are, are there areas and times where not, where not only that ought to be done, but that is very needful? Church? Absolutely, Yes. This was not one of those times. Brother Wayne, this was not one of those times to get buddy-buddy with your sister churches because you want everybody to like you when you go to those community luncheons, you know, that you never get invited to when you're a fundamentalist. But when you want everybody to hold your hand and pat you on the back, but this, this wasn't one of those times. I believe G. Cameron Morgan is right. He says, sometimes... These things that arise and these concerns, man, they need to be cut out with a surgeon's knife. It's not a little sweet talk. It's not a little, let's pep them up. It's a, hey, this has to change. If, if you got wind of one of our teachers erring in their teaching and going away from Scripture and teaching false doctrine, let me tell you here in the public, you don't even have to come to me. It's going to be handled, right? We're not going to say, hey, we're going to give you a couple more weeks to infiltrate the minds and hearts of this class, and, and then we're going to deal with this. You want a doctor to do that to you physically? If he finds something in your body that needs to be removed before it spreads, you want him to just leave it alone for a while? No, and so we, we begin to understand the emphasis of that word must. These mouths must be stopped. 
So, Tim, there wasn't a little conference that said, you know, guys, we need to come up with a way. We, we ought not to be doing this. We, we need to kind of come up with a fancy way to. No, it must be stopped. It's got to be put to an end. We cannot continue to allow. And I'm just going to leave this here. You will be surprised by what's being allowed in churches today. That did not used to allow the things that they are now allowing. Man, we need church to remain and, con- and, and to keep a sense of urgency regarding the damage that false teaching does. All right, you say, well, Pastor, we, 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 we're thankful, we're blessed, and, and with God's help, we're, we're going to maintain that standard here. Well, hey, amen, that, that is definitely our task and our mission and our desire. All right, but what about in the community with the people you interact with? What about the things you have backed away from telling them when you know, ding, 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 you knew error was just stated because you know enough about truth, but yet you were not willing to confront that. You were not willing to say, hey, you know, that's a popular thought these days, but would you have a couple minutes for me to show you what the Scripture says about that? Hey, could, could, could we take a week or two and both of us just dive into the Word of God and, man, let's see what, let's see what Jesus says about that. And you're not careful, those same thoughts teachings and doctrines and ideology is getting into the hearts and minds of the families of our communities today. We've got to be on guard. For once false doctrine is embraced, listen, the poison spreads quickly. Poison spreads so quickly. It always affects others. And then here's a tragedy, Brother Phil. It often takes down those that were unsuspecting of what was going on, of what was taking place. Then the verse says, teaching things which they ought not. And now their heart is revealed, right? Right? Because what does the end of the verse say? Any names and faces come to mind? Television evangelist? That'll say anything and have said anything they need to say over the last decade or two. That they need to say to thicken their wallet and have monetary financial gain. Hey, there's nothing wrong with having an airplane, is there? <laughs> I hope not. And I'm not trying to throw off on television evangelists. But these guys that have built their ministry around just taking the money out of poor grandma's banking because she heard that if she'll just give $1,000, she'll just call this number at the bottom of the screen and give $1,000, boy, she's going to get a healing. She's going to get a blessing. She's going to receive some kind of anointing rag in the mail that she can rub over. Man, she's going to be all better. Sounds weird, right? But it happens happens today in in our circles i don't know the holy spirit is giving me this right now so i'm gonna say it now i think i think our guys i think we we need to be careful when we go to preach for someone because now scared may not be the right word but we're concerned that if we go into a pulpit and preach too hard on something well, they may never have us back. They may, never, they may not invite me to come preach a revival again if I go and preach on sin or preach on something hard that the Holy Spirit tells you to preach on. And I'm all for encouraging. I believe we preach the whole counsel of God. You cover everything we as humans need. Amen? I'm just curious, what would, be, what would be the percentage of revival messages that are loving and encouraging or come close to the 
reprimanding and rebuking. And I'm not talking about trying to take a pastor's spot in his local church. That's what God has him there for. I promise you this. Preachers today stray away from messages that God gives them and tells them to preach because they're scared of how the people will respond. If a man of God is not willing and obedient enough and loves his congregation enough to preach what the Lord tells him to preach because he's scared somebody's going to get hurt and they're going to walk out the door and their ties are going to walk out the door, then he needs to go find something else to do. And I'm not trying to be rude or crude. I'm just telling you. They're doing it for financial gain. They didn't care the cost spiritually. They taught a message that served their financial interest. In it for the money. Seeking to gain all they could financially. Happens still today. We need to stay on guard. Let me give you this and then we'll, we'll cut this in half. Number two, we need to guard against a falling culture. We guard against a falling culture. How many of you join me in wishing in our hearts that we could make a statement to someone else, hey, our society's getting better. <laughs> hey, things are on the up and up. That is far from the case, isn't it, my friends? And yes, we believe God still has the power to send a revival to whatever degree he wants to. One church, one community, one state, across the United States, across the world. He has that power. I believe that. But that's got to start with the church. We're not going to see a mighty moving of God that we say we hope for if the church as a whole remains in the condition that we're in. Because in many cases, the church is on life support. In many cases, the church is just getting by. In many cases, the church has changed from being what God has called us and ordained us to be to be what people want us to be. And although the pews may be full or they may not be full, there's not much of a church left. So if we want to see a mighty moving of God, we have to guard against a culture that is falling, that is departing. Look at verse 12. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own. So here's what a prophet within their own circle said. The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. Gluttonous. You go preach that message on your next endeavor of street preaching and see how many people fall in love with you. (laughs) Right? But this was one of their own. Calling them out for what they were. He said they're liars, they're evil beasts, and slow bellies. Guarding against the culture that was around them. The Cretans, the people of Crete there, revealed uh, these characteristics of, of themselves. Man, what, what a bad list to be known for. I mean, any of you want to sign up for that? Any of you want people to say that about you at your funeral? (laughs) The Christians had a reputation widely known to be liars. Widely known to be those who refused to embrace the truth. Widely known as men of depravity and and wicked in their, their character. Widely known as... People who were lazy. Listen, I, got, I ain't got time for laziness in, in, in any art, work, or fashion. Amen, church? But especially the work of God. These people were known for these things. And their own calls them out and says, The Christians are liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. And then we read in verse 13, This witness is true. Paul saying, Man, he was spot on. He stepped on their toes. He hit the nail right on the head. He hit him right between the eyes, right? That's what Paul's saying. He's saying this is a very accurate description of the Cretans and the bad 
reputation they had. Now, before you, before you tune out tonight, we're going to go into our prayer time. Let's, let's end part one here. How many of you acknowledge our culture around us is falling? All right. How many of you acknowledge that our falling culture around us has had influence on the families in the culture? The Christian families, excuse me, the Christian families in the culture. Amen? All right, one more step. How many of you realize that because the falling culture has had a negative influence on the Christian com- families in the community, it has therefore had a negative influence on the church? True? 100% true. In every case, absolutely not. Thank God by His grace. Amen? But in many cases, true. Now, I know I've got to be careful here because the human mind, for all of us, works differently. And there can be some well-intended people that say some good things and not think maybe they're not as analytical as I. So, okay, so take it with a grain of salt. I just, I just preferenced it. But if you talk to people about, about church and about listen to what they say about the church and what they like about the church. Have you ever even stopped to think about that? I mean, there's a difference to me. If you come up to me and you're inviting me to church, and you begin telling me, okay, hypothetical situation, and listen, I want you to come to church with me. Our pastor, man, he preaches the word of God. Our music is all about God. It honors him. Man, you're going to find a people that love God and love others. Okay, that communicates one thing to me. Agree? And if I got any sense in my head and I think church is important, I'm going to be like, well, man, those are three pretty good elements. You know, I know he didn't go into all the doctrine. He didn't give them the the be a member speech. But, man, he told me the word of God is preached. He told me the Lord is lifted up and worship is all about him. He told me that the people love God and they're going to love the people that come in there. And then I run into somebody else later in the week. And they're all they're all peppy, too, and excited. about. By the way, we ought to be excited about church. And they said, man, I want you to, I want to invite you to come out. Oh, yeah, where are you going? Man, we go so, so. Listen, I want you to come to church, man. Listen, listen, you come just like you are, man. Listen, man, we, we rock it out, man. We got the lights out. We got strobe lights, bro. Man, you just, whatever you come, man, you bring your coffee in the service, man. We give you donuts, man. You just, you just come on, man. We're going to have a good time. Don't you want to come to church? We're going to have a good time. Now, some of us think that's exaggerated. Trust me, it's not. And the fallen state of, all, of our culture, as, as foreign as this sounds to us, many people are going to be in this line. Because doesn't that sound so much better? I mean, coffee and donuts in service? Oh, and by the way, man, our preacher, man, he always just gives an encouraging message. He's never going to preach on sin, man. You, you ought to come and be with us. Doesn't that sound so inviting? When this is what our culture needs, this is what our culture is being fed. So let's ask ourselves as a church, as an as a individual, as a family unit, all right? The Christians were just told what they're known for. I mean, one in their own circle called them out. They're liars, they're evil beasts, and they're slow bellies. What are we known for, Brother Linwood? I'm not talking about past. I'm not talking about some stick in the mud that person has. I'm not talking about somebody left here because they didn't get their hand shook enough times on a Sunday morning while they sat there and pouted in their pew. And so they got to, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when we seriously engage in a conversation about Wildwood Field Baptist Church, what is Wildwood Field Baptist Church known for? We, we know what we want it to be known for. We know what it ought to be known for. I think I know what we would say. What's our testimony in the community? Is it that we put a premium on the Word of God? Came all this time.
Close your ears for a minute. All right, we're good. Is it because we put a premium on this? And with love and compassion, we're going to preach it, realizing sometimes it's going to go through our steel boots, and sometimes it's going to knock us over, and sometimes it's going to drive us to our knees begging God to forgive us. I sure hope so. Hey, are we, are we known for a ministry that does music? I mean, our musicians, no doubt, do it with excellence. But are we known for a ministry that has a music ministry that, yes, done with excellence, but even before the excellence, it's done for his honor and his glory? That a song sung on Sunday is not sung just because it came out on the latest Christian top of the chart? What are we known for? Are people known for sacrificing their their time and their preferences and their this and that to, to go out of their way to make a guest feel welcomed and loved and, and I bragged on I, Brother Wayne's in the way I bragged on Miss World the other night had some kids where, where Brother Ken and Brother John were and took it upon herself to, to move up two seats and to interact with those kids and to help calm them down a little bit Now, some of you may have picked up a hymn book and hit them in the back of the head if that was you. <laughs> what are we known for? It's, it's a good place to pause tonight, isn't it? And then you take those same questions to your family, the Braswells. And I can't go all the way around. The Tedders, the Falks, the Newkirks, the Mills, the Prices, the Norfleets, the Clarks. What are we known for? If we're serving Christ and ambassadors for Christ, does it matter? Yeah, it matters. Let us be on guard. The false teachings in this place, but also in our community circles, where because we want to be a part of a group or we don't want to Rock anybody's boat, we're just going to keep silent about something we know is not right. Huh? And are we on guard against the falling culture? That I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's polluting churches left and right, and maybe more than you and I know. God, would you help us tonight? Lord, we're not throwing rocks by no means. We are far from perfect, and we realize that. Lord, we are walking in grace and need your help and need your guidance. Lord, we acknowledge all those things. Lord, we thank you for your hand upon this ministry, but we're asking for you to continue to lead us and guide us and direct us. And Lord, we don't want to be unkind. We're just trying to, to preach the truth that all around us, quote-unquote churches, that that once stood on the same biblical principles that we that are still valid today that we still apply and stand upon Lord, are no longer in that same place Lord, it doesn't happen overnight it doesn't happen because one or two people walk into the building and flip the switch and oop all of a sudden it's different Lord, it happens because we have lowered our guard against a falling culture we have lowered our guard even against false teachings. And Lord, now you got people confused. You got people trying to search, but they get so many different variants. God, it's a shame, honestly, all the things that are done under your name. So Lord, help us as a congregation. Help us as individuals. Maybe it's for a family unit tonight. Lord, I know. I know. And, Lord, it's not, it's not just now with the teens. Lord, the world is, is full court pressing our kids and putting things in their minds and their hands and trying to get in their ears and hearts. Lord, that is 
a part of a falling culture. So maybe it's for a family unit tonight. I don't know. And Lord, Lord willing, we'll pick up next time on, on how your word says to go about that. God, help us tonight to ponder that question. What are we known for? And if it's this, this, and this, then Lord, are we, is our walk matching our words? As dads and leaders of our homes, we say we want this, this, and this. Are, are we making sure that we instill the principles and put the rails in place and put the guidelines in place to bring that about? Just help us tonight, Lord. As your Holy Spirit speaks, may your people be faithful to obey. Heads bowed, eyes closed. You come. I'm going I'm to leave you there in your pew tonight, but you, as far as not standing, but if God's speaking in your heart right now, you get up, you come. Maybe you need it as a man, a leader of your home, a leader of your marriage. Maybe you need it as a lady. You've seen some things and you've had questions about things. Maybe you need it as a couple. Maybe you come tonight as a family. Maybe you come because God has put his finger on something in your heart. And you acknowledge, you agree with the need to guard, but you see areas that you have failed to do so. Brother Bob is going to play one more verse. You come. You come.